So, as an MLB executive, you implemented programs that have addressed the dwindling numbers of African Americans in the sport. What do you think caused the decline, and what does the league need to do to fix it? Well, that's not a very easy answer. It's a, it's a complex situation. You can start by saying the, the decline was caused by what I call a perfect storm of events. Uh, if you look back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and even the early 70s, the three major sports in our country were horse racing, boxing, and baseball. So naturally, many uh, of the uh, African-American athletes that came out that went to play in the popular sport uh, found themselves playing the one team sport that was part of the, uh, the top three, and that was baseball. In addition, there was baseball. It was so popular, it was called the America's Pastime, and there was an entire African-American league, the Negro League, that was like baseball. And many of the larger, the larger black-owned businesses in a lot of the cities were the uh, Negro League baseball teams. So naturally, it became popular, and many of the athletes went to play. However, as basketball and football became more and more popular, many of the athletes started migrating to those two sports. And that's why you have the, the, the you know, basically the numbers that you have. You know, basketball is probably in the, in the neighborhood of 80% African American. Mm -hmm. uh, and football is probably uh, closer to 70%. So, you know, that's, that's, that was a natural migration of those athletes. Now you say, well, why would they leave if baseball was so popular and baseball was such a tremendous way to make a living? Why would these guys all start leaving, African American guys leave and go to the other two sports? Well, the very basic reason, you see, because basically athleticism is, is determinative of winning, more so in, base, in football and basketball than it is in baseball. You see, if, you have, if you're a 16-year-old or 17-year-old tremendous athlete who's African American and you get introduced to the sport of football or basketball, you have a very high uh, chance of being successful. In baseball, not so much. You see, because baseball is more of a collection of skills. A collection of skills you usually learn very early in life and usually taught by a male member of the family. If you look at the African-American family, many times there was no male member that was there to lead the family and to teach the game of baseball. Most women don't play baseball and, of course, wouldn't teach the baseball skills that a kid would need for success. And it was much easier for that same child to find success if he went to basketball or to football. Add to that that baseball is a pretty expensive sport to play. You look at the amount of green space needed, you look at the amount of equipment that's needed to play, baseball, is in the, and also the maintenance cost uh, uh, for maintaining baseball diamonds, it becomes more expensive than if you had a black top with a basketball goal in the middle of the city. Then, of course, one basketball in the neighborhood and everybody could play. So that made it also an easier sport for city planners to, to actually put in their community, in the city community especially, because it was so cheap it had such low maintenance cost. Further, if you look at um, football, for instance, the Division One football program has 85 scholarship opportunities. Baseball has 11.7. .7. So if you look at the math, it's very simple to see if you were a mother of a child who could play baseball or football, and he needed help to go to school. From an economic standpoint, it would behoove you to push him towards football. Uh, very much so, yes. So, so what has happened is these, these kids are, are, you know, they see the numbers or they see, or in their community, if, there's, if they don't live in a affluent suburban community, they don't, the facilities aren't there, or if you look at the fact that uh, many of them don't learn the sport. You had all those things together, and it almost conspires to drive uh, the African American not to to the other sports. And that's why our numbers now have gone, baseball's numbers have gone from a high in the mid 70s of about 27% to a low now of about 8%. Mm -hmm. And it even gets even worse as you go down because if you look at the minor league level, it's about 5%. Mm -hmm. and if you look at the college level, it's about 3.5%. So the number is getting more and more bleak as you go down the ranks. Mm -hmm. So pretty soon, you know, as I once uh, joked with a, a group of uh, African-American players in baseball during a meeting that we had, I said, who can be the last baseball player, uh, last African-American baseball player? You know, because they'll be probably the first this, the first that, the first this. In baseball, one day we may have to say, he was the last African-American baseball player. 
Wow. Mm-hmm. So, and then I got one other reason I'll bring up, and that's part of the MLB's, uh, uh, what, what, how did they contribute to the problem, is that a lot of the baseball teams, all the baseball teams for that matter, have academies in Latin America. Mm. Every individual club has an academy in Latin America where mm-hmm. there's nothing but teach kids baseball. That's why you see so many Dominicans, mm-hmm. so many Venezuelans, Panamanians, all these guys are coming because we, in Major League Baseball, clubs, individual clubs, own academies in their country and teach them baseball. And you say, well, why would they do that? Why would the Yankees have an academy in the Dominican Republic and not put one right in the Bronx where they play? One very basic reason. If the Yankees were to develop a player in the Dominican Republic, when that player turns 16 and a half, the Yankees could sign him to a long-term contract with no competition. If that same kid grew up in the Bronx and was developed by the Yankees in the Bronx, when he came of age, he go into the draft, and everybody would have a chance to get him. And if the Yankees, who were perennially at the top of the heat, they would always draft draft. Therefore, they have very little chance of getting the kid they developed. So that's why all the kids have gone abroad to develop all these kind of players. So Latin American kids can be signed without having to go through the drafting process then? Yes, ma'am. Is that an MLB rule? Is that a rule? How it, I've never, I didn't MLB know that. Rule. It is an MLB, MLB rule. Okay. Yes, ma'am. MLB rule. Okay. So how do we how do we change it? How do we prevent um, there from being a last African American baseball player? Well, it's going to take it's, it's one. The problem didn't happen didn't happen overnight. Therefore, it's not going to be solved overnight. You're going to have to put in the time, the effort, and the money to develop the game in the communities where African Americans are, uh, and that's one of the reasons. Uh, a lot of the reasons that was behind uh, my. Uh, Starting the academies in Compton, Urban Youth Academies, which the first one started in Compton, California. The second one uh, we put in Acres Home area of Houston, Texas. Uh, we have one in Puerto Rico in San Juan, and one in uh, New Orleans. Uh, those academies uh, have gone a long way in getting kids into uh, the system. There are probably as many as 50 to 75 kids that are playing minor league baseball that came from that academy system, that four, uh, that four uh, academy system. Mm-hmm. In addition, uh, last year, five kids played major league baseball. I mean, that's in a very short while since the first academy opened in 2007. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, right. You got five kids that played major league baseball. Uh, and so it, 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 it gets to a point where, and, and there will be, more. There'll be more coming in. Uh, but if you, we don't keep priming the pump, if MLB decides, oh, well, we've done enough, then what will happen is, of course, the numbers will start to decline again. Because whether you like it or not, uh, you've got to go and bring the game to the kids in order to play it. But Dominican kids wouldn't play baseball the way they do and be at such prolific numbers like they are if MLB didn't take the game to them. Okay. And that's So the programs, those are MLB funded programs, right? So right now the MLB is making a conscious effort financially to try to develop African American talent, correct? Uh, well, they, uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll say this, uh, yes, the answer is yes, they are. That's qualified, yes, because what is happening is MLB does fund the entire academy, the entire academy and uh now, the Houston Astros and the city of Houston um, puts in most of the money to operate the academy in Houston. The uh, operation in um, San, uh, uh, San Juan is also a group of, of, of entities, including MLB. In addition, you have uh, New Orleans, where it's a group of entities, uh, in addition to MLB, that are also helping fund that. In fact, majority of the funds used to construct the academy in uh, New Orleans were FEMA funds uh, oh. that, uh, that uh, were paid to the city of New Orleans uh, because of Hurricane Katrina. There are many ways to uh, fund an academy, uh, its operation as well as its construction, but MLB's 
and has participated in each of the ones that I've named. Okay. All right. Thank you. That was very, very interesting. I learned some stuff on that one. Um, you did. I, I did. I did. <laughs> Um, I know a lot of the historical stuff because I'm a, I'm a history person. I know you are too, and I've and I've studied the history of African Americans in sports. And I'm sure you've read the book Forty Million Dollar Slaves, which has talked about our transition and how things have been occurring. So I'm familiar with the historical side, but more of the baseball, the 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 really deep reasons why. As far as the development, having developmental programs in these Latin American countries, um, I didn't know about. So that was that was new to me. Um, as someone who has been on the corporate and slash management side of professional sports for many years, in your opinion, why are minorities so underrepresented in these positions? Well, um, that, you know, it's, it's kind of. I mean, some of the reasons will be somewhat similar. You know, you've got to, you have a situation where in sports, uh, you know, people just don't leave. It's so hard uh, to get any kind of upward mobility for jobs to open. And you have, it because sports is so sexy, everybody wants to be in sports. So for every job opening, there are thousands and thousands of resumes. A lot of times, you know, because they're not in the pipeline, uh, you know, they're not, you know, and a great example would be why, why, you know, is there right now only two minority uh, general managers? Uh, you have uh, Ruben Amaro in Philadelphia, and then you have Kenny Williams in Chicago. Well, the reason is kind of a lot of, if you look at the numbers of the assistant general managers out there, the numbers are also abysmal. There are only a few African American assistant general managers. So naturally, when it's time to select a new general manager, whenever that time comes up, the, 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 the deck is pretty stacked. Mm -hmm. And you've got to be pretty lucky and hopeful, hopeful that it opens up and you're available at that time. And so it's, it, it becomes a tough one. Now, there is a uh, policy in Major League Baseball that certain jobs have to interview minorities. Uh, and, uh, and more often than not, baseball does attempt to do that. However... Uh, there are exceptions, and many of the exceptions are sometimes utilized. And, you know, so the numbers, until we get more and more uh, African Americans into the pipeline, many of getting many more, and that means effort on everybody's part to make sure that this, this happens, because it's just, it, 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 it's very easy to let these guys who sat around for years as assistant GMs then take the jobs. And, you know, and the, as the numbers uh, dwindle on the field now, I mean, you there was a time when there were like five, four or five African American managers on on, on the field in mm -hmm. Major League Baseball. Mm -hmm. I think now uh, maybe there's two, and both are in Texas. Uh, they, they're both Porter in, in Houston and uh, Ron Washington in uh, the Texas Rangers. That's Texas Rangers. Because Dusty was let go this year, and uh, I think that that brought us down to two. Mm -hmm. So the numbers keep going. Every now and then you'll get a push when you know the public, when people like yourself uh, write write a lot of columns about uh, the lack of African Americans, and then you know, of course, baseball then feels uh, that it should move, and it does. Uh, but the problem is you've got to keep it going. You can't ever stop stoking the fire because if you do, the numbers will the, the flame will ever again, and that's just the problem. That's just going to be always going to be the problem if you don't see the effort to it. Diversity doesn't happen on its own. No one has, there must be a catalyst, there must be something to push it. Right. And some person, usually, usually and, and it's always usually the person in, in, in a position of authority. Right. All right. Um, what are your thoughts on the O'Bannon versus NCAA case? How do you think a judgment against the NCAA would affect collegiate sports? Hey, give me a softball there, right? <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, all, all, those, all those images that have been used for all these years that have made all those millions for these NCAA uh, institutions, you know what happens to stop that money's owed after all that, all, those, all that time. Can you imagine the millions and millions and possibly billions of dollars that will be owed to all these players? I mean, just think about it. If the likenesses and images uh, of these players uh, are the property of these players, or at least some portion thereof, mm -hmm. that's just very significant. But why do you think NCAA is fighting so hard? I mean, geez. I mean, that's a lot, that's a lot of dough that they're going to be having to shell out if that turns out to be the case. So, it'll hurt them a lot. And what
what way specifically? How do you think it would change the face of 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 college athletics? Do you think? I think it would. Well, I, I think that you know, they, it, 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 what it would do is uh, it would probably restructure how the relationship between the scholarship athlete or any athlete that participated for a university would probably be under a very. I mean, if, yeah, if I were attorney for the NCAA, I would have strict uh, strict the language. Uh, basically, that would basically spell out what all NCAA rights are and what all the players' rights are, and I have those rights probably going in perpetuity. Um, uh, and and basically uh, try to get it all on paper, almost like a contract. Mm-hmm. Your scholarship gives you, uh, you know, by, 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 by you accepting our scholarship, you give up certain rights. Mm, and those okay. rights will be set up a certain way. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just kind of how I would do it as an attorney for the NCAA. If I had, if, if I were found to be liable for the usage of these uh, licenses. Mm-hmm. I mean, you got to think about it. There's a lot of ways you can, you can contract away your freedom and your rights, and, you know, your obligations. If you, if, you, if you do it, if there's consideration on both sides and you do it, you can contract away those things. And the consideration on the side of the athlete will be a scholarship. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of money being pushed on both ends because it would. I think that that case could really change athletics as a whole. Um, and uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, what happens with that. I, I've been well, keeping a close eye on that. Well, not only that, you know, what if the athletes, what if somebody could ever get a figure out how to unionize the student You imagine that if they were represented by some like a bargaining agreement or negotiation? I mean, wow, think about that. You know, that's, uh, that's pretty, that, that would really turn the NCAA around. Right, it would, exactly. It would really change it. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is your opinion on college athletes getting paid? Well, I, um, <laughs> I, uh, I do have feelings about that. I think uh, having, I uh, have a lot of my relatives have been collegiate athletes. Uh, my daughter was, I was, my brother's nephews, you name it, cousins. Um, and I guess the thing that always rings out is you know, I've named all these relatives of mine who've been athletes, but only uh, a handful, only a couple graduated. You see, people always tout, you know, well, this, this kid got this great education, this great scholarship, this great education, this fine institution. Well, the question is, how many of them graduate? Uh, can every athlete take all the labs they need to graduate? Can they take all the classes and the course load they need to graduate in four or five years? Most times not. Mm-hmm. That's why you see the few that do get uh, degrees come back and get those degrees afterwards. You see, and that's always the issue. What, how do you come back to school afterwards? Say you don't, you don't make it to the NFL. Say you don't make it to the NBA. And you come back to school, you have no eligibility. You have no scholarship. There's no money for you to go to school. So at the very least, I'm going to say there should be something. If it's not a stipend set up for that athlete uh, by virtue of, of, of all the hard work they do in a revenue-generating sport, if it's not uh, uh, some type of uh, uh, insurance against injury or the chance you don't make it at the pro level once you take less than you need to graduate on time, then at least give you a certain amount of time where you can go to school tuition free or, 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 or money or, or free of charge in order to get your, graduate, get your degree within a certain number of years past your graduating class. Right. I think that is important if you're going to say you're offering them a four-year scholarship, which four-year scholarships do not exist. It's a series of four one-year scholarships. Mm-hmm. You screw up anywhere else in the line, they can revoke your scholarship. So the point is, is that if you're telling me the kid got a four-year scholarship, the kid did his time at the university, did not make professional, did not become a professional athlete, can the kid at least come back to school within two years or three years of his graduating class and get his degree free of charge? I mean, at least that. So he can at least have a degree and right for the workforce and try to make a living. Right. That's how I look at it. So, and then, you know, and then if you're not going to do any of that, then just, just pay them pay up their money. I mean, you're, you're saying they're student athletes. Well, you only have one and done. You got two and done in the NFL and in, in the football. You got one and done in basketball. Are they are they student athletes? I dare say not. Right. So let's just let's just stop the facade and call it what it is and, and deal with it as it is, and then you'll be fair to everybody. The whole idea that a kid can't leave uh, school but has to play uh, in the has to play college basketball for a year, or at least uh, basically can't come in until he's nineteen, or in one year after his graduating class, tells you right there there is some kind of understanding that you know he's needed. These revenue generating schools need him in basketball. 
just, it just, you know, it just kind of the American way is to, uh, if you're valuable and you do make money, everybody's getting paid except one, one group. Exactly. That doesn't seem quite fair to me. Right. Uh, you know, I can explain, and you can explain it to me better if you tell me he has a guaranteed uh, chance to get his degree. Now, that's different. A guaranteed free chance to get his degree. Then I say, okay, that's a better argument. But you're not saying that. You're saying he has a chance to go to school here, and if he acts right, and we say do, then he has a chance to graduate, possibly. Right. Okay. Yeah. I definitely I I agree wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly. Um, I know you're also an agent. What's the most common mistake uh, made by players and your peers during contract negotiations? Well, I, I saw that question, and, and the, comp, the the real mistakes I made during the negotiations necessarily because you're the most 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 of the, most of the young people now are sophisticated enough to go out and get you know, an attorney or a reputable uh, negotiator to handle their their negotiation. So it's not that's not where the problems usually start. And you do have some people that come in and do some very unorthodox contracts with a very weirdly structured contract. But for the most part, uh, collective bargaining agreements have helped them streamline that process. So it's kind of hard to screw up the negotiation unless you really have somebody that wants to commit malfeasance and is really trying to be uh, dishonest or really uh, just doesn't know what he's doing. Mm-hmm. And that's a rare case. I think the, where the, the real problems come for the athlete is afterwards. What happens with your uh, dollars once you've achieved them for this negotiation? Where do they go? Do you have the aptitude to understand how to speak money with your financial planner, with your accountant, with your attorney? Most of the kids don't today. They have no idea, and, and they and you see the problems that take place. Usually, it has to do with where my revenue went after I got it. Right. Oh, my contract was horrible. In the old days, that happened sometimes, but now it's usually where did my money go after you've already achieved it for the negotiation process. Right. Yeah. Uh, also, but that means picking people who can handle uh, your business dealings, people to handle your investment. And also, and also taking ownership in in your. I'm a former financial advisor, so I, I, this is that's a topic that I'm kind of passionate about. And I think that you run into problems when you just hand over responsibilities without um, taking some sort of ownership in them as well. That's why you have a lot of players who go back and they're suing their financial advisors, or they're saying, "Oh, now I'm broke." Well, were you just uh, giving total control to this person. I understand that person had a certain level of um, responsibility to do their job, but I think more athletes also need to take more um, ownership and, and invest in them, their own knowledge on the money end. Well, of course, that's easy for us to say because we, we went to school, we got yeah. our, our degrees, we, we understand what the regular maturation process, uh, you know, we knew what it was to have not, you know, basically budget because we didn't have five you know, infinite amounts of cash being thrown at us. So it's a lot of, it's very easy to say that stuff. But that kid has been through a time, he was 12, 13 years old, been pretty much taken care of and been asked to do things that you and I will never have the opportunity to do because he's so gifted and God gave him so many gifts. So now all of a sudden, he's now 19 years old. He's been paid cool guys of money. And he's being asked to work out year-round, play year-round, do all these things. So naturally, he doesn't know what to think. He can't even speak uh, 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 your language. You, you talk to him about EBITDA, you talk to him about uh, uh, compound interest, you make a freaky say, prime plus one. He doesn't know what you're talking about. Right. So one has to educate the athlete. One, he has to be, uh, he has to be uh, educated in the fact that he needs to know it. Then two, he has to learn it. Now, that's, that's a, you know, you have a 19-year-old, I, I know a lot of 19-year-olds, and uh, they don't have any kind of money, and they, they, he can be a little tough getting them to do the right thing, getting them to, and, and, you know, basically take ownership of their own investment, and then to learn it because they're so sophisticated. You know, I talk to my financial uh, advisor, and I tell you, my eyes glaze over a lot of times. He's going through all these 
reasons that we're going to go into REITs and ETFs as opposed right. to bonds. And, you know, I'm sitting there going, gosh, can you imagine a guy who has one year of high college get that under his belt and was probably a C minus student when he was in high school? It's overwhelming. There's the go. So it's like Mike Tyson only said a couple of things that, that I ever repeat. <laughs> <laughs> You're, you're absolutely right. Um, there have been rumors that you were fired from your position as MLB VP of Operations. Would you like to address those? I, I was not. Um, now, people can know a lot of people said a lot of things, especially there's a lot. I didn't really talk on it a lot of press. But uh, uh, it happened abruptly because my contract was ended. And uh, I was asking uh, for not only an extension, but for a specified definition of duty. And what kind of support and funding we would have under those. And when I didn't get the answers I wanted, and especially when I didn't get the answers in some of the areas that I thought were most important, then it was just pretty clear that it was time for me to figure out what else I wanted to do. And then there were always those who were clamoring to get into the game and push to get into the game, and everybody knew operations and everybody wanted to have an opinion on it. And it became increasingly more difficult and unwieldy to do that, to handle that department, at least in the direction that I wanted to go. Mm-hmm. So it was, and, and then also this one, you know, I, I'd be lying if I didn't say that there were some times when you think about uh, upper mobility, how much upward mobility did I have? And it didn't seem like there was going to ever be a change at the top. So it was clear that maybe, you know, but I still uh, could walk up right, <laughs> <laughs> and I still have a few marbles in my head, that maybe I didn't see what else was out there. Okay. Well, what are your plans for the future, and do you expect to remain professionally connected in any way to Major League Baseball? Uh, Major League Baseball, is, I, that's, that's, that's murky. I don't know. I don't want to ever say never to anything. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but right now, I'm trying to look at other areas, look at other places. The personnel in Major League Baseball pretty much still stagnant. Everybody is still there. Uh, I see the machine still grinding in a direction that I thought could have been enhanced, and I, so far I don't, I'm not enticed to want to go back and be a part of that again. Uh, so what I will say is that I, I do plan to be involved with young people, which is my, my, my largest passion probably in life, and I want to be involved in sports. So if I can marry those two and, and of course, monetize it, then that's, that's, that's a good way to go for that. Do you continue? To, I know that you have a few... Um programs, and I'm assuming that you're going to stay very actively involved in, in those, right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and then, yeah, and then I'm really excited about my bots, my young bots, and my young tennis player. I'm uh, very excited about them. Taylor Townsend uh, was, uh, in 2012, the number one uh, junior tennis player in the world at 16 years old. Uh, we just finished 
finished her first year as a professional at the age of 17. She had a, a, a what I would say is a, a, a good, not great, but a good year. Uh, she uh, actually was runner up in four tournaments uh, in doubles. And uh, she's now under a new coach, Zena Garrison, and working very hard with uh, uh, Zena in Washington, D.C. And we expect she's going to come out the gates in January like everybody. And Andy Ruiz, uh, my boxer, uh, who I manage, who, Albert, who, who uh, trains in Las Vegas, had two fights this year in Macau, China. He even fought recently on the Pacquiao Rios ticket mm. and uh, did very well. He is the intercontinental uh, belt holder in the WBO as well as the NABF uh, as a heavyweight, and he's number six in the world. So I think that even if things are working for Andy, he could have a heavyweight uh, championship fight with one of the Klitschko's, I assume, even in 2014. Wow. So I'm very excited about those two right now. Okay. Well, I, I've heard of Taylor Townsend. I've, I've, um, I've been, um, I think I, either I've written written an article or, but I have heard of Taylor Townsend. So now that I know, now that I know that she's connected to you, I will be keeping track of that, and um, I'll be I'll be definitely tracking your your boxer as well. So absolutely, thank I, you very much. 